Taking Out the Trash by Cylon X. A few months ago, I got bored and tried something crazy. I made no effort to hide the fact that I was putting a corpse shaped tarp wrapped in duct tape into the dumpster behind my apartment complex. I just left it on top. No one even bothered to call the police. I left it there for two days, and I never so much as got an angry phone call from my landlord. The truck eventually came by and carted it off. That could have been a real dead body, and no one cared. More to the point, None of my neighbors who saw me do it said a single word to me about it afterward. And it was around that time that I began to realize how utterly meaningless life is. I could be a depraved, corpse-fondling serial killer, and no one would bat an eye. But if I neglect to separate my glass and plastic bottles in the recycle bin, I've got the property manager bitching at me on the phone at 9 in the evening. It absolutely boggles my mind. These people couldn't give a fuck less about a potential dead body in the dumpster, but they'd nitpick over the smallest detail if it remotely broke from their cultivated image of a nice apartment complex. I live in a single story row of one bedroom apartments about five minutes from the interstate in a relatively generic city. I say this because, while there might be a million people in the metropolitan area, no one is making television shows or movies set in our area. It's just another Midwestern accident that somehow turned into a megacity. My neighbors are mostly single office workers or divorced 30-something-year-old men. Those are the worst. I can always tell it's Sunday morning when my neighbor Jim's screech and crotch spawn shout at the top of their lungs as they run around his apartment. I asked if he could keep it down during the mornings, but he gave me a bullshit excuse and went back to spend time with two fuck trophies from a failed marriage that were about as displeased with his presence as I was. I carried what looked like a corpse to the dumpster in front of his kids, and they never looked up from their cell phones long enough to notice. As his wife showed up in an SUV with her new and more successful husband, not a word was said as I walked right past them into my apartment. Perhaps the only thing worse than listening to Jim's kids is after his wife leaves, and he just plays the same Katie Lang CD on repeat as he sobs like a baby and cries himself to sleep. It was raining cats and dogs outside. I had been up for 10 hours dealing with debug assertion errors on a batch of code a colleague had left unfinished on the project's Google Drive. It was already 7 in the morning, and I was ready to crash, but that cuckled bastard next door was blasting the same tired music as loudly as before. Despite his door being right next to mine, I still had to step out into the pouring rain to knock on his door. It nudged open on the second knock. I stepped inside to get out of the rain, and that was when I noticed Jim in a lace teddy with a bottle of scotch on the table next to an empty bottle of pills. His skin was blue, and his eyes stared off into the void. I reached over to turn off his stereo, and for a brief moment, I considered calling the police. Call it a morbid fascination or maybe just a sick obsession, 
but I was overwhelmed by the urge to replicate my experiment. I wrapped Jim in a comforter I had grabbed from his bedroom and taped him off before lugging him through the rain and into the dumpster. I made it a point to go back to his place and wipe down anything I might have left fingerprints on just in case. A day later, the truck came and he was gone. In fact, no one noticed Jim was gone until he was late on rent and the landlord ended up using his key to get into the apartment. I guess that's how things work in this complex. No one cares enough to interact, and everyone is happy to leave well enough alone. It wasn't a week before the unit had been rented out to a woman in her mid-thirties. Thankfully, she didn't seem to have kids visit for a weekend visitation, and if she played any music, I never heard it through the paper-thin wall that separated our apartments. I hadn't actually killed anyone. But if I had, I realized all too horrifyingly how easy it is to get away with murder. Jim's ex-wife never showed up looking for him. I eventually tracked down his Facebook page, and not a single person had even left a comment asking where he was. Before long, I was Facebook stalking my new neighbor. She posted photos of food she ate and generally had maybe two or three likes on each post, all from the same people. I'm pretty sure one was her mother. I spent the rest of the night looking up the people that lived in my apartment complex, and it became clear to me that all of us were disposable people. We had little, if any, connection to each other or the world at large. My building and the one across the parking lot that served as a mirror image of it served as a home for people no one would miss. No one cared. Jim killed himself, and no one cared. I left bodies in the dumpster, and no one cared. Karen, the woman who lived next door, posted pictures of food she ordered at Chipotle and shared cat memes. We were all forgotten people who existed only in the sense that we worked a job and generated income for our landlords. I decided to break that cycle and do something about it. I waited until 7 in the morning and made it a point to lean on the hood of my car, smoking a cigarette, as Karen came out of her apartment. She smiled awkwardly, and I waved. I had spent all night working up the urge to actually connect with another human being, and in the moment, I felt like a wet feather mattress had been dropped on my chest. I awkwardly said, Welcome to the neighborhood and forced a smile. Karen responded with, Oh, thanks, as she shuffled past me into her car. I dropped the half-smoked butt on the ground as I walked back into my apartment, feeling defeated. I spent the rest of the day in bed, trying to sleep, as I wrestled with the existential dread that had been seeping into my mind for weeks at that point. Knowing that I was all but invisible to the outside world was so crushing enough as it is, but being unable to connect with other lonely people sealed the deal. Something inside me broke. I turned my attention away from Karen and made it a point to interact with anyone I saw outside. Most said exactly enough to politely leave the conversation and went back to their solitude. It wasn't enough that these poor bastards were doomed to be alone. They seemed content with it. At least Jim had the presence of mind to end the monotony of it all. Somewhere along the line, 
I decided that I wanted the corner apartment near the dumpster. Unlike my apartment, its southern wall had a second window in the living room that faced an adjacent apartment building. It sounds silly, but the thought of having a little bit more natural light and a better view seemed really appealing to me at that time. The only problem was that James had lived there for 10 years and seemed to have no desire to move. I bumped into Karen as I was loading James's body into the dumpster. She was struggling with her bags and I offered to toss them in. She didn't even seem to notice that her rubbish was being used to cover the body of our recently deceased neighbor. She either didn't notice or didn't care that I reeked of industrial solvents I used to clean up my mess. She simply smiled awkwardly and went back to her apartment. By the end of the month, I had moved into my new apartment and I found myself enjoying the view. The people in Building C weren't like us. They had parties and seemed to have visitors. On more than one occasion, I had seen them talking to their neighbors. I longed for that kind of social interaction, but I couldn't wrap my mind around a way to solicit that kind of attention from others. It didn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out that Karen thought I was creepy. I mean, I don't blame her. I did leave bodies in the dumpster and talk to anyone I noticed outside. I wasn't exactly the miscongeniality of Wendell Court. I think that's what made it especially hard. One night, while I was going through my nightly rounds of Facebook stalking the other residents of our shared apartment complex, I noticed that Karen had made a status update about her creepy neighbor. As I read through the post, I realized that she thought I was stalking her. I mean, I was, but not in the way that she perceived it. She thought I was some sort of freaky sex criminal or something. Even still, I realized that she might have noticed more than I wanted her to, and I really didn't want to risk losing my apartment, much less my freedom. The lease has a very clear zero-tolerance clause for sexual harassment, and I realized that all it would take is a single complaint, and I'd be forced to find another place to live. My lazy landlord never changes the locks on these apartments. He has a key to all of the doors and just makes copies when a new tenant moves in. I took no joy in moving Karen into the dumpster. I had really hoped that we'd develop something that resembled a friendship. Even still, she rested atop the mountain of discarded microwave dinners and empty milk cartons that comprised the waste produced by our collective of sadness and solitude. No one said a goddamn word. Just like before, no one even attempted to reach her by posting on her wall. As I had suspected, she was just another disposable person that had been sent to the trash, and that summed up her life. No kids, no job. She lived on alimony from a failed marriage and lived with the knowledge that her husband was plowing a woman ten years her junior with a kid on the way. On the other hand, I was two murderers into an incredibly self-destructive habit. And my only real satisfaction came in the realization that yet again, I had disposed of the evidence with the most minimal of effort. Three missing persons that no one missed. Two violent murders that no one was investigating. It became clear to me that someone could do the very same thing to me, and no one would miss me. My ex-husband had long since remarried. I didn't have any kids. My parents were estranged. I had no siblings. I worked from home 
and only talk to my boss on the phone maybe once a week, if that. With the exception of casual interaction with the residents of Wendell Court, I could go weeks at a time without any real human contact. Given the ease in which I dispose of the others, and how easy it was to fall into that pattern of behavior, I realized I probably wasn't the only person killing the residents of our apartment complex. I lived in Building A. Directly across from me was Building B. In the mirror to my apartment was a man in his 40s named Jerry. Jerry almost never left his apartment. And when he did, it was to make short trips to the dumpster or to check his mail. Even his groceries were delivered. It didn't take long to notice that his habits were eerily similar to mine. It wasn't long until I had placed pinhole spy cameras on his windows and on the window to his back door. Each apartment had a windowed back door facing a concrete porch in the bedroom. When I wasn't working through code or working up the nerve to talk to others, I was watching the camera feed. Jerry was a creature of habit. Each night, he'd hack away at his keyboard, doing something or other, while taking breaks to masturbate or hit the bathroom. Several days of this passed before I noticed something odd. He had stepped away to use the bathroom. I didn't notice that this image on his screen looked eerily similar to mine. I started scouring the window on my back door and noticed a white pinhole camera tucked under the window blind. I wouldn't have noticed it unless I was looking at it. I found the others and moved all of them to my monitor. I placed each one in a row atop my monitor and stared at them. Jerry had done the same. I stared at him, and he stared at me. His face was a dark reflection of my own. If I smiled, he smiled. If I stood up to move outside of the range of the camera, he did the same. This all changed when I returned to my monitor, and he was writing something on a piece of paper. He held it up, and it showed a single word. You. He proceeded to toss the paper into a waste bin behind him. He knew, and he had every intention of snuffing me out. He walked off camera and was gone for several minutes. It dawned on me that he was moving towards my apartment. James was asleep when I bashed his head in with a hammer. Karen had been sitting in her recliner with a pair of headphones on when I came up from behind her with a karat. At no point in my life had I actually been in a fight with another human being, and it was dawning on me that I could end up in the dumpster with each passing moment. I briefly considered running to my car, but then I realized he might already be waiting for me. Instead, I opted to order a pizza to Jerry's apartment. As a delivery driver pulled up, I moved towards my car and was inside it just in time to see Jerry stand up from behind the dumpster and move towards the pizza guy. I spent the rest of my night at a waffle house using TeamViewer on my laptop to watch Jerry sitting there as he ate pizza and stormed around his apartment. I waited until he was in bed to drive home. I parked down the street and walked to my back door to avoid being seen. I looked at my screen and Jerry remained in bed. I turned off the streaming app and made my way outside. I didn't have a key to Jerry's apartment but one of the things I found incredibly lazy about our setup was how easy it was to jimmy the locks. 
I used an old debit card to gain access to his back door, only to find his bed empty. I moved slowly into the kitchen and checked the bathroom. The living room and its adjacent closet were also clear. I moved back to his computer and stared at the screen as I saw him standing over my bed with a baseball bat. He looked over at the camera for a moment before heading out the back door. I stepped into his bedroom closet and waited as he re-entered his bedroom. The kitchen knife in my hand didn't offer much in the way of comfort as I watched him sit at his desk. I stood there, halfway holding my breath for the better part of 10 minutes before I worked up the nerve to burst out of the closet and plant the knife firmly in his neck. I pulled the knife away as a spurt of blood exploded across the room and splashed the wall. I brought the knife down again, just as he threw up his hands at it. It went right through his forearm. He wrenched his arms away and took the knife with him. As he stood up grasping his neck, he stared at me with hateful eyes as I picked up his baseball bat. My first swing connected with his forearm and made a crunching sound as it bent his arm backwards. My second swing connected with his temple and sent him to the ground. My last swing landed on the back of his head and sent him to the ground. I set to work cleaning up and wrapping him up as per usual. Just as I was finishing up, I noticed the green LED light on his webcam was still on. I pulled up the various window on his taskbar and realized that he had been recording the whole incident as a YouTube live stream. It was set to save the stream as soon as the connection ended. I have no idea how many, if anyone, viewed the stream, but I became increasingly aware of the fact that someone might have watched me kill Jerry. I sat there and ended the stream before frantically moving to delete the video from his channel. I proceeded to take his computer with me to the dumpster. I tossed Jerry and his computer into the trash and spent the next two days locked in my apartment, frantically searching the web for any mention of Jerry being missing or any local murder investigations. Ultimately, no one cared. No one cared, and I was safe to live my life. None of my neighbors seemed to notice Jerry's absence, and no one seemed to care if I was inside cowering or outside peering around corners like a paranoid crackhead. My landlord showed up a few days later to inform me that I was being evicted. Enough of the residents had complained about my erratic behavior and I was given 30 days to move out. I briefly considered fighting it, but realized I was better off moving on. It didn't take me long to find a new place on the other side of town. I gotta admit, I love my new neighbors. One of them even greeted me with a six pack and an offer to come over sometime. I just might take him up on that offer. I think one of my favorite things about this new building is the trash chutes on each floor. I hadn't had much of an opportunity to figure out what the limits are, but I'm keenly aware that each hatch drops into a dumpster outside. I doubt I'll ever have to use them like that. My neighbors seem nice. Well, all but this one bastard that lives right next door to me. He keeps playing the same fucking playlist every night.